Anti-war author and spiritual leader Thomas Merton died mysteriously on December 10, 1968 in Bangkok, Thailand. Investigative reporter Hugh Turley makes the case that the conclusion that Thomas Merton died by accident cannot possibly be true. Hugh Turley and David Martin are co-authors of the 2018 book, The Martyrdom of Thomas Merton, an Investigation. According to the authors, Merton was in apparent good health and at the height of his productive powers when he died suddenly and mysteriously while attending a monastic conference on December 10, 1968, near Bangkok, Thailand. He was 53 years old. Up to now, no one has examined the circumstances of his death systematically, critically, and what's most important, honestly. Was Thomas Merton murdered? by the CIA? It's time for Progressive Spirit. Stay with us. This is Progressive Spirit, progressivespirit.net. I'm John Shuck. This show originally aired live on my program, Beloved Community, on KBOO. My guest this morning is Hugh Turley, and he is the author, the co-author with David Martin of an important book that just came out called The Martyrdom of Thomas Merton, an investigation. 1968 uh, is, marks the 50th anniversary since uh, Merton's death. And uh, what was his death? Was it a heart attack like the Thai police originally um, had reported? Or was it an electrocution accidental? Or was it a murder? Those are the possibilities that we're going to uh, look at uh, today. And Hugh uh, Turley is with me uh, on the phone from Washington, D.C. Uh, welcome, Hugh. Thank you uh, for having me on, John. And I'll see you I went out here. It's a local thing here. But in Washington, D.C., we call it the logic-free zone. The logic free zone. Well, we're going to yeah. put some logic in that free zone uh, this morning. I, I'm, I'm fascinated uh, by this book, uh, The Martyrdom of Thomas Merton, an investigation. Uh, one of the, the first book, really, that looks um, seriously and honestly uh, about the death of, of, Thomas, uh, of Thomas Merton. To, uh, by our way of setup for this, I'm going to play a clip from an interview that I had with uh, theologian Matthew Fox. He came out with a book in 2016 called A Way to God, Thomas Merton's Creation Spirituality Journey. And in there, he, he didn't go into it a lot, but he did talk about um, uh, his belief and in his conversations with uh, agents from the CIA over the years that... Uh, Merton's death was not accidental. So I'm going to play that clip. It's about three minutes, and then I'm going to come back well, to he, you. He, he, he had just finished giving a talk entitled Karl Marx and Monasticism, which was not the most prudent title for a talk in Southeast Asia in 1968 at the height of the Vietnam War, as you may, as you may recognize. Um, he had been getting um, death threats for years uh, from the FBI, and, and they had been... Then the CIA had tapped his phone and intercepted his mail, just as they did to King. And um, I have spoken to three CIA agents over the last 30 years who were there at the time. I said, did you guys kill Thomas Burton? The first one said, I would neither affirm it nor deny it. The second one said, we in the CIA at that time in Southeast Asia were flooded with money. There was absolutely no accountability whatsoever. If even one CIA agent felt Burton was a threat to the country, he could have had him done in with no questions asked. And um, remember that Merton was the mentor to the Berrigan brothers who went frequently to his monastery for gatherings. And, um, and of course, the FBI were chasing the Berrigan brothers all over America. And uh, so they knew that Merton was the mentor to these um, radical, uh, though nonviolent, um, Catholic priests who went to jail frequently uh, protesting the war in Vietnam and nuclear war in general. And then the third person I asked um, was this past year after my book came out. I said, uh, did you guys kill Merton? And he said, yes. And he said, the last 40 years of my life, I have spent cleansing my soul from what I did in the name of uh, the CIA when I was a young man in Southeast Asia. So I think uh, it's a, a proven deal that Merton was, was murdered. Uh, for one thing, 
uh, he was there in Bangkok at the height of summer. It was December 10th, that summer in Bangkok. And he arrived the day before. So certainly he had this fan on the day before and it didn't kill him. So what is this? Why did it have this terrible shorten at the next day after he'd given his talk uh, when he stepped out of his shower um, and supposedly uh, plugged the fan in? Now, you and I would not step out of a shower soaked and wet and plug a fan in the wall. And Merton was not... Um, an abstract kind of guy. He was very grounded. So I think it's um, it stretches credibility to think that he stepped out of a shower soaking wet and plugged the fan in, and that's what did it. The, the, clearly, they did see that there was a, a serious short in the um, in the fan. But again, I say he must have used it before uh, he went off to do his talk, and so I think it's very very likely that someone snuck in there when he was speaking and did uh, did him in that way. Matthew Fox speaking there from an interview I had with him a year ago uh, on his book, A Way to God, Thomas Merton's Creation Spirituality Journey, uh, with his uh, suspicions and uh, that uh, Thomas Merton's accidental death wasn't so accidental. But my guest today have put these pieces together. Uh, Hugh Turley, uh, The Martyrdom of Thomas Merton and Investigation in his book just came out uh, in 2018. In fact, Matthew Fox just wrote a review. Um, Hugh, I, ju- I just saw that just minutes ago, uh, a couple of days ago, that he wrote the review on, on Amazon, a very favorable review of your book. So uh, what do you, uh, you, you know, Matthew Fox, by the way? Well, it's just, just, uh, Casually, I mean, I, I, I corresponded with him uh, back and forth with email, and I just sent him a letter the other day. And he's a very nice man. And I, I, what I really admire about uh, about Matthew Fox is that he's a thinker, and uh, the, it, that's his gift. Is he's a thinking man, and whether you agree with things he says or not, he is a thinker. And I, I noticed in his book, he he made two good points that no one else really touched. He, he and he said it in that uh, clip you played that. It doesn't make sense that a man as intelligent as Merton would be playing around with electricity while he's wet. It, it doesn't make sense. And the other question that he put to, in his book as well is, uh, if the fan had a short in it, how did that happen? And it's a great question because Merton had been in this cottage for two days using the fan on it all, all the time without any problem. And the police report said that there was a cord that had been uh, in the, a faulty cord had been installed in the fan. Now, who installed the faulty co- cord? And when I talked to Matthew uh, and he read my book, he, he was surprised. He said to learn it was a Hitachi fan. Now, Hitachi is a very fine company in Japan, and they make great products, and they're not known for making household appliances that kill people. So they kept that name out when they mentioned he was killed by a fan. Some people call it a third world fan or an old fan or so on. But it was a Hitachi fan. It was a very modern looking fan. I have a photograph of it. It was a pla- you know white plastic. Just 1968 is probably manufactured in the 60s. <laughs> the killer fan. Well, anyway, we're, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about how the story uh, that that. Uh, um, he was electrocuted coming out of a shower uh, was was really a later story uh, that you mentioned uh, in the book. Yeah. Before we get there, uh, tell us, uh, first of all, Hugh Turley, how you became to get involved in uh, investigating this case of uh, Thomas Merton. Well, I guess it's, it's, a lot of people, I guess, are curious because he died the same year as Bobby Kennedy and Martin Luther King in 1968. He was a, a similar man, of, of, of a quality man uh, who was interested in peace and nonviolence. So it was suspicious that he died that particular year, but I hadn't really uh, done much looking. Uh, I'm not a professional investigator, but I did. I was involved in a case uh, about this, like 25 years ago. It was the death of the deputy White House counsel, Vincent Foster. And that's how I met my co-author, because he had gone to college with Vincent Foster at Davidson in North Carolina. And he had been curious about that case. And that's how we bumped into each other, uh, researching Foster's death. And my co-author had been bugging me, saying, Turley, he said, you got to look into Merton's death. And the 50th anniversary is coming up. He said, you, you really should look into that. So I finally did and uh, started around 2012 trying to contact people and, and get documents. I wrote to uh, a man named John Eudis Bamberger, who I was told knew Merton. He was a Trappist monk. And 
and he told me that he'd identified the body and so on. I asked him some questions. He didn't actually answer any of my questions. I wanted to know the following. I wanted to know if there was a death certificate, who found the body, if there was an autopsy, and if there was a police report. And those are, those are very important documents to have when you're looking at a death. You need to see those documents. And it took me a while to get them. John Eudas Bamberger didn't have them. And I eventually found them, and I found two copies of them. I found them through a man named Rembert Weekland, who was in Thailand at the time, and the embassy gave him copies of documents. And he left Thailand with those documents and held them all that time. And when I called him and asked him about Merton's death, he said, I'll send you the documents. And he sent me his documents that he had been holding all that time. And then I went to the National Archives because I knew the U.S. Embassy was involved, and I thought, well, the State Department must have had some records. And there again, I got more of the same documents, but different versions. They aren't exactly the same, but I got the, the death certificate, the doctor's certificate, which we, we call a coroner's report. That's the doctor that went to the scene. And then there was uh, the police report, as it is, a police report. And also there's a, another document called the Report on the Death of an American Citizen by the U.S. Embassy. And these were interesting because all of these documents said he died of a heart attack, and there was nothing in there about an accident. In fact, they said he was dead when he collided with the fan. They said he died, and as he fell over, he bumped into the fan. And that's that's what people, and that story hadn't come out um, for some time, right? Has that heart attack story been known? Never. No, it, that was actually that was reported in Thailand at the time. In the Thai newspapers, they reported he had a heart attack. The American newspapers, from the very beginning, the day after his death, the AP, the New York Times, they all ran that he died of an accidental electrocution. That was the that was the press version for this country, and they never reported that there was a heart attack to the American people. And the monks at Gethsemane Abbey, where Merton was from, they went with the what the press said they went with the accidental electrocution story because that's what the press said and they actually were, were received those documents the i have a letter from the embassy in bangkok dated december 27th merton died on december 10th and on the 27th they mailed the abbey the death certificate the doctor's certificate and their own report and they all said heart attack so the the abbey got those but they didn't tell anybody that they had them. They didn't tell anybody about the contradiction. Uh, and later, uh, like last year, I I had been looking to see if the Abbey actually had those documents that were, had been mailed to them in 1968. And I talked to their archivist. I said, do you have copies of these documents, the doctor's certificate, death certificate, so on? He said, no. He said, those would be at the Merton Center. And the Merton Center is a, a place at Bellarmine University. It's a has a collection of all of Merton's documents and works. I contacted them, and then they said they didn't have these documents. So I sent my copies down to the Merton Center. I thought they should have them in their collection. And the director of the Merton Center, Dr. Paul Pearson, thanked me. He said he'd never seen them before. So those, uh, <laughs> they had them, mm. but they lost them somehow. But they knew they existed. Um, well, they did from the beginning. In 1968, they knew they existed because they were sent to them. But they, they just disappeared. The Abbey didn't have their copy. The Merton Center didn't have a copy. I got my copies from the National Archives, as I said, and from Rembert Weekland, and I sent them to the Merton Center, and they had not seen them before. This was, that was a new thing for them. And it's, it's incredible to me that in all these years, with all the people that have written about Merton, and, I mean, there are scholars from universities, all around the globe who've written about Thomas Merton, and they've all said he died of an accidental electrocution, and none of them even bothered to get the basic core documents, the official documents. Nobody bothered to get a death certificate. I mean, these are the first things I asked for, and I'm not a college professor, but Matthew Fox is a thinker, so he figured stuff out because he's thinking. These other people should have been thinking, too. They're writing about Merton's life. They're writing uh, biographies. And they just all parroted the same story over and over without ever looking at anything. It's there, but people don't look. It's sort of, uh, if you look for things, you find them. Isn't that surprising? <laughs> right. If you're just joining us, my guest is Hugh Turley. He's on the phone with me from uh, Washington, D.C. He, along with David Martin, are co-authors of The Martyrdom of Thomas Merton, an investigation. 
Now, the story came out later. Talk about this, how, how this sort of mythology, we might say, uh, developed. Um, it, 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 isn't, it wasn't enough, as people said, well, how does he get electrocuted by a fan? He must have been wet. And, and so suddenly the various biographies of Thomas Burton talk about him, as you write in the book, uh, several different ones that, well, he was coming out of a shower or he slipped on the floor or he was wet. Or, or How did this story get going um, uh, of the fact that uh, somehow he was taking a shower and then got electrocuted by the fan? Okay, well, the shower story came in 1973. which is five, five years, years later. After. Okay. Five years later. And it originated with a, a monk at the Abbey who was Merton's secretary named Brother Patrick Hart. And uh, Brother Hart wrote a, what was going to be a postscript to a, a book they had put out through uh, New Directions Publishing. It was a book, this, uh, of, it was a journal, Merton's Journals of His Asian Trip, His Last Trip. And in this book, they thought they'd put in a postscript about the death, and Brother Patrick wrote the postscript. Now, he wrote it actually in 1970, the postscript, and he sent it to a man named John Moffat, who had been at Bangkok, in the, near Bangkok, I should say, because it wasn't actually in Bangkok, but it was at the conference center where Merton was, and Moffat stayed in the same cottage as Merton, so he was there at the time. And when Brother Patrick wrote this story, he uh, he said that he looked at the police reports, he looked at the medical reports, he said, I've read the witness statements, and he said, I'm going to tell you how this happened. He said, Merton went back to the cottage, and he wrote it, you know, I think he wrote uh, at uh, 3 o'clock, at, uh, what did he say, 2.30, and he got a, died, at, it took a, proceeded to take a shower and died at 3 o'clock. Well, Moffat said, well, you can't write that. He said, that's not true. He said, I, you know, I was there. He said, he didn't go back to the cottage at 2.30. I mean, he was, he was, uh, he was uh, in the uh, lunchroom. He said, you know, he, he went back, he got back to the cottage at 2 o'clock. And uh, Brother Patrick just changed the time. And, uh, but he, he stuck with the shower. He changed the time and said Merton died at 2 o'clock. But uh, he he. He said that he uh, had gone back and proceeded to take a shower and and then uh, touched the fan and moved the fan and, and was electrocuted. And Moffat said, you can't say he took a shower. He said, there's no evidence. And I got this correspondence. I found their letters back and forth. And Moffat wrote to Brother Patrick and said, you really shouldn't say he took a shower because there's no evidence of that. In fact, one of the witnesses said that he, when he saw the body, he said he thought he might have been getting ready to take a shower. And he was the man who lived right next to Merton, and he knew he didn't take a shower, but he, you know, since he was partly undressed, not totally, but he was wearing uh, his uh, short pajamas, like summer pajamas, when he was found. But anyway, Brother Patrick stuck with it and put the shower story in the Asian Journal of Thomas Merton, and the rest of it went on from there. People repeated it in their own fashion. They'd say he'd say he was in a bathtub. They'd say the fan fell in the bathtub. They'd say he slipped in the bathtub and grabbed the fan. He was stepping out of the bathtub. He was stepping out of the shower. He was wet. He slipped on the floor. And it just, sometimes he's grabbing a lamp. Sometimes it's a ceiling fan. I mean, it's everything you can imagine. There must be 50 different versions of the story that he was wet from a shower or a bath and touched something electric and died. And that's... And it all originated, all originated with Brother Patrick in 1973. Prior to 1973, there's no mention of any shower. So that's that's how it's uh, that's how it came about. Now, of of the started, of the people who were there around uh, that that time in 1968, um, are any of them still living? Well, Rembert Weekland is still living. He's in um, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. He was he was the man who presided over the conference. And when the three monks found the body, one of them went and, and summoned him, and he came. So he was the fourth person on the scene. He arrived at the same time as a nun who was also a doctor, a medical doctor. So they, those two arrived at the same time. So he was one of the first people there. Did you get a chance to and correspond he, with him? Well, I talked to him. I interviewed him uh, several times on the phone. I'd, I'd written to him, too, but I, I, we talked a lot on the phone. I interviewed him several times because I'd have questions, and I, I wanted to ask him to clarify things. So, so But what, the yeah. other the others are all gone. They have, the, the other uh, people that were right there at the scene have all passed on. Yeah. So, uh, um, 
I mean, there's there's it seems to be a number of um, as you mentioned in the book that there's really uh, from the very beginning um, deception and, and a cover up, uh, including with the Abbey itself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in fact, I, I contacted Brother Patrick, who created the shower story. I wrote him a letter and I asked him to tell me what evidence he had that Merton took a shower. Uh huh. And uh, you know, he's elderly. He's he's living in the infirmary now at the Abbey, and he doesn't take visitors, but. I wrote to him, and I know since he's elderly, I thought, well, I said, if, you, if it's difficult to write back to me, I said, you can just call me. Well, he called, and I was at a baseball game, and I, I didn't have my phone on, but he left a voice message. And he answered my question. He said, well, he said, actually, there isn't any evidence that he took a shower. But he said he must have taken a shower because Bangkok's very hot. <laughs> that's that's, that's all it. he had. That's it. That's but, it. And it makes a better story because how do you get electrocuted by a killer fan, right? Unless exactly. It's... Yeah, they needed the. That's where they added the water. But it's just been. But it's the, the story has gone on and on and on. But he's the originator of the shower story, Brother Patrick Hart. We are going to take a little bit a break, and then we're going to come right back. This is the beloved community. I'm speaking with Hugh Turley. Uh, he's the author of the Martyrdom of Thomas Merton: An Investigation. I'm John Schock. This is the Beloved Community. I mean, my guest is Hugh Turley, he, and along with David Martin, are the authors of The Martyrdom of Thomas Merton, an investigation. Thomas Merton uh, died on December 10, 1968, nearly 50 years ago in Bangkok, Thailand. Uh, he was uh, uh, the, the main, main speaker at the conference in Bangkok. Now, someone might say, well, what would be a motive for uh, uh, behavior against Thomas Merton that would be adversarial? But uh, he isn't. He wasn't just um, kind of a, a run-of-the-mill priest. He was a major thinker and quite an influence in terms of, of peacemaking. Can you talk a little bit about uh, 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 Thomas Merton's work? Yes, Roy. I'm not a. I've read some of his books. I haven't read all of them. He's really written about seventy books, but he also wrote about ten thousand letters, and he he corresponded with a lot of people, and he. Became famous really in 1948 when an autobiography he wrote called The Seven Story Mountain came out. and It was very popular, and it sort of made him famous. And then he wrote a lot of other books, but he was concerned with war and peace, and he understood that the press uh, influenced people's opinions, and they can steer people into war. And, and he understood the propaganda nature of the press, and that the press isn't always truthful. And he was a critic of the media, uh, along with what was even popular. I mean, that, back in those days, I was in college, and I remember they were telling us that Walter Cronkite was the most trusted man in America. And a lot of people believe that, but uh, Merton didn't. And Merton even questioned the assassination of John F. Kennedy uh, within a week. I mean, I read his book, uh, Con- Conjectures of a Guilty Bystander, and he, he states to me that the whole thing of Oswald killing Kennedy was just absurd. And he, so he was sort of questioning, sort of like Matthew Fox, and the guy was a thinker. But he was also an influential thinker because he was writing books and writing to people. And that made him a threat to the establishment that's sort of trying to keep a, a lid on things because he's telling people that things they're being told are not true. And uh, that, that made him dangerous. So the same as Bobby Kennedy and Martin Luther King. I mean, Martin Luther King spoke on the mall here in Washington, he spoke to 250,000 people. I mean, if you can draw that big of a crowd to come and hear you speak, you've got some influence. And uh, that's the kind of man Merton was. Although he wasn't publicly out there with a microphone, he was making an impact. And he was right in the eye of the storm in in Bangkok, Thailand, uh, during the Vietnam War, wasn't he? Oh, yeah. There was the the Indochina War was really all over and all around him. And there were so many CIA assassins in, in Thailand, I mean, he was, he was really walked right into a very dangerous neighborhood and, and put himself at risk. So that, that, was, a, that was serious uh, where he was. It was dangerous for him to go there, but, I, you know, he, he, was some, he was not really afraid of anything. What made him also made him powerful was his poverty. Uh, he wrote once that poverty is our strength. And, of course, a lot of people will go along to get along, and they want the approval of others. They want money. They want a job. They want to please their parents and in-laws and so on, so people get caught up in things. But Merton, being a monk as he was, didn't have any possessions. You couldn't take anything away from him except his life, and he didn't really care if you did, because he had bigger plans. Uh, so 
he was uh, a fearless man, and that also has made him a dangerous man because he was untethered. He was not tied to the earth in any way, and, and uh, that made him like, very dangerous to the people in power. What was uh, his, not, uh, Matthew Fox, in, in my interview with him, said he was writing, his conference paper was about Marxism or something. Uh, <laughs> did you have any idea what he was talking about at that conference? Uh, a little bit. It was He, he was sort of tying, I think, the... the you know, the, he was drawing some parallels between, it was a monastic conference of people that lived in monasteries, so he was trying to just to talk about the, the similarities between their life in Marxist and uh, communism, where, you know, sort of each gives according to their ability and takes according to their needs, and, and uh, that's kind of, I think, was what the talk was sort of about, is the similarities. You can always draw similarities and differences between things, and that's what he was talking about. It wasn't any... Um, thing where he was telling everybody, let's all become Marxists. I think he was just saying, we're, we're sort of living the communist life in our own little worlds, you know, in a way. And he was right about that. But he didn't favor communism. I mean, he saw communism was was uh, was dangerous, too, but he, he didn't think that the Vietnam War was the solution to communism. He thought, I think he thought more dialogue uh, and peace uh, is, was a better way to, to, to work with people that you have differences with. I like, I like to talk about the photographs, if I can. Yes, that's what I wanted to talk about, Jack, because that was the big piece. That you, that's, that's, a, that's a new piece of evidence. Talk about the photograph and talk about uh, uh, the uh, religious leader Celestine uh, Say. Yes, well, uh, Celestine Say was a Filipino uh, Benedictine monk, and he lived in the—he was a very young man, but he, he was in the same cottage as Burton. And they didn't have walls between their rooms. They had screens, like window screen. And for walls, and they had doors, but those window screens were the walls for ventilation, and they hung bed sheets for privacy. So he was in a room where he could hear everything in Merton's room. He could hear Merton's feet pitter-patter across the floor when he walked. So auditorially, they were in the same room. And when they came back from lunch, he was walking behind Merton. Merton was with another man called Francois de Groon, who's kind of a mysterious figure. And Say was about five minutes behind them, and he saw them go into the cottage, and when he entered, he went to his room, took off his habit, and went right to the bathroom to brush his teeth. So he was in the cottage moments after Merton. But at that point, Merton was already dead. They killed him as soon as he entered because Say never heard a peep from Merton's room in the next two hours. But this other fellow upstairs, uh, Francois de Groon, was walking around, pacing the floor, opening and closing his door. And he came down at one point and told uh, Say that he thought he heard a shout. Say said, I didn't hear anything, and then he went back upstairs, and the groom was sort of trying to establish a, the shout at the time that Merton died, but he was, uh, he's a very strange character. He's a chapter in himself in our book, Yeah. but so when Say, uh, at one point, the groom comes down and says, I think uh, Merton's had, a, had an accident. He said, he looked in his room, and he took him over, and, and they peeped in through the door, and they could see him lying on the floor with his fan on top of him, and the groom said, I'll go for help. And he ran out, and, and he saw two monks. Uh, uh, Egbert Donovan was one, and uh, Odo Haas was the other. And these two, these men were both Benedictines as well. So they came in. Uh, the groom took off and headed in the other direction for the main building. So now we've got three monks uh, in the building, and they're, they're trying to get in the door. It's, it's locked from the inside, but they realize if you reach inside the, these louvered panels, you could unlock it. So they got in. And as soon as they entered the room, they could see he was dead. And Egbert Donovan said to the other two, don't touch anything. He's already dead. And they could see it didn't look right. And Odo Haas told Celestine Say, who had the room across the parlor, he said, go get your camera and take some pictures. We have to show the police how we found him. So Say went and got his camera. And in those days, we had to have a flash to shoot indoors. But you could adjust the light settings. The cameras had adjustable settings. So he took two of photographs at different settings. And only one of them turned out. The other one was just too dark. It came up kind of black. So he had one photograph. Now, they, they didn't develop instantly like digital cameras. This was something you had to take to the film shop and get it developed. But when the police came, they could see that uh, this was not a real investigation. I mean, they didn't really think this is uh, very professional what they were doing that they reached their conclusion without really doing anything they said oh yeah this guy had a heart attack and that's that and <clears throat> so
Say didn't tell the police about the photographs. He took his film back to the Philippines, and when it was developed, he mailed the picture to the Abbey of Gethsemane, and he asked uh, if they had an autopsy and what they found, and he said, uh, here's this photograph I took. I want you to have it. Well, they were alarmed when they saw it because, of course, they didn't have an autopsy. There was no autopsy. But they could see from the photograph it didn't look right. Now, when I say it didn't look right, I'm not allowed to publish the photograph because I don't own the rights, but I can describe but it. But you've seen it. Merton, you, you, you got oh, these I photographs. Have, oh, yeah, I, I have copies of it. But see, he, Merton was found in the, in the corner of the room, and in the corner there were two clothes racks that kind of went perpendicular into the corner. These are these uh, racks with, like, dowels, you know, little rods on them, and, and he had hung his habit there. And then his head was in the corner by the clothes racks, and his feet came out from the corner at about a 45-degree angle. And he's lying on his back, and his arms are perfectly straight, palms down at his side. Now, I don't know if you've ever come upon someone who's fallen down by accident, but people don't fall straight, flat on their back with their arms at their sides. People go down in a heap. I've seen people go down. And if you, if you have a heart attack or you have, get, get punched in the nose or someone, uh, you know, has an accident and trips, people don't fall that way. It's just very unnatural. And the fan is there. And Edgar Donovan uh, later wrote that he didn't think Merton could have touched that fan and, and landed in the position that he did with that fan on top of him as it was. The fan was at a 45-degree angle across Merton uh, with the motor of the fan on his pelvis. The base was down by his feet. And the, the fan blades itself was to the uh, right of Merton's head, which is similar to, to a diagram um, that was uh, that, yeah. that 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 was early on. So that this uh, photograph actually confirms. Uh, right, the, the diagram was drawn by the nun who was a doctor. That I could put in the book because that yeah. was from a public document. But that that is the diagram that's in the book, and the uh, this is a very unnatural position. I, he has his shorts on. I mean, his pajama shorts. So that they weren't only really worried about the water at that point. They weren't worried about the shower because that story hadn't been invented yet. But the Abbey did not want anybody to see that photograph. So John Howard Griffin, some people might remember him, he wrote a book called Black Like Me. It was very popular in the 60s. This was a guy who painted his face black with some kind of dyes and dermatology chemicals and supposedly went into the black community in Mississippi to see what it was like to be black. Well, it's kind of a strange story, but it was very popular at the time. And he was uh, a friend of Merton's, and he was living down at the Abbey for about two weeks of a month. And when he saw the photograph, he told the brother Patrick in the Abbey, he said, we can't let anybody see this. Uh, we got to get the negatives. So he wrote to the Filipino and Father Say, and he said, well, thank you for taking this picture. It's a very important picture, and we're really glad you took it. But we need to have those negatives so we can protect it, see? And uh, Say wrote back and said, well, I'm not going to send them to you. He said, I'll send the uh, negatives to the abbot. He said, I trust the abbot to, to do what's right, so I'm going to give it to him. And he did send them the pictures. And in my research, I found all these letters. I found a letter from Griffin to Say and back and so on. And I, I, uh, I knew that these things existed, this photograph, and the negatives. But I didn't know where they were until I came into John Howard Griffin's papers. John Howard Griffin died in 1980. He had diabetes. And when he died, his papers went into storage. And 14 years later, 1994, the, his papers went to the University of Texas and also to Columbia University. <clears throat> well, the Merton papers went to Columbia. So I got some documents from Columbia, and I could see from the PDF files I was looking at that that the negatives, it looked, what looked like the negatives were there. But I didn't want to call the library. I thought if they knew what I was looking for, they'd probably say, well, that's sensitive. It's a dead body. You can't have that. So I went up with my wife, and uh, we drove up to New York, and I got to the library. I was so excited. I brought the box of documents out, and I flipped it through. I found the envelope from Father Say, registered mail, and his letter to the abbot, and there was the strip of negatives. So I put them on my computer screen as a whiteboard, and then I photographed them. And then just using the app on my phone, I was able to reverse them and see the pictures for the first time, including the one that was underexposed. Because with digital imaging, you can draw things, change the, you know, the, the color and contrast. 
So I, now I had both photographs. And so you, from and seeing the, those photos, you could see that really his body lying there, it, it, you could, it's obvious to tell that this is a, a staged um, setup. Oh, yeah. yeah and I'll tell you one, one big clue in the pictures is uh, the, uh, I told you about these clothes racks, right? Yeah. That they're, they're in the corner. Well, from the picture from the right, you can see that Merton's shoulder is about an inch away from the bottom rod of the clothes rack. And when you look at the other picture, you can tell that he's not away from it as, as uh, to the side of it. He's uh, about an inch and a half away from it by being underneath of it. So his shoulder landed underneath this rod of the clothes rack. And, you know, you don't fall and get underneath something. He would have fallen and hit it and knocked the thing over. But he, his shoulder was underneath the clothes rack. And that I think the clothes rack may have been knocked over in a struggle and then they or when he fell and they somebody sat it back up where they put the pan on it but that thing sat up after he had been on the floor they probably put his arms at his side to roll him over on his back but the uh the, anyway the, i got the photographs that way first but then i did ask the library to i ordered them and they they didn't know what they had they they made very fine tiff files about 34 megabytes uh, of these photos, and then they sent them to me, and then they asked me, what are they? Because <laughs> we want to catalog them. Can you tell us what we're looking at? And I told them it was a dead body of Thomas Merton. And I said, you better protect them, because those are very rare negatives. But that's they do show you that he was, it, it's a staged crime scene. It's pretty obvious just from looking at it that this is not a natural position for someone to fall in with a fan on top of them. And, and then, of course, when they start the shower story, People say he came out of the shower, the bath. He was naked. Well, you know, nobody comes out of the sh shower with their short pajamas on. Yeah. The bath. I mean, you, you know, it's just it, it, it's 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 the, the the photographs really kind of blow a hole in everything. The photos are are, 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 are we say metaphorically the smoking gun. Yeah, yeah, they really are, and they and they they. I asked the Abbey if I could publish drawings of them. I had drawings made by a a courtroom artist here in Washington who draws uh, drawings for the Supreme Court. And they're nice drawings, because I didn't think I'd want to publish a photograph of a dead person that I said it, it's not respectful, but I thought the photo, you know, the photos can be done as a drawing. And I sent the drawings to the Abbey and asked permission. And uh, Abbott Dietz down there said, no, we don't want you to publish those. If people want to see those, they can go to the library like you did. Yeah. Well, I'm going to so, come back and talk more about those photos, and I want to also to have you uh, talk about what, kind of what, what you think happened in the big picture here. I'm speaking with Hugh Turley. He's the author of The Martyrdom of Thomas Merton, uh, co-author with David Martin, uh, an, an investigation in the 50th anniversary of the death of Thomas Merton is December 10th, 19, uh, uh, well, 2018 is the 50th anniversary. 1968 is when he was killed in Bangkok, uh, Thailand. Um, it likely, likely looked like this book here is one of the first books, is the first book really to look uh, specifically and, and honestly and logically at what, and as well as picking up, bringing up new evidence, including this photograph of what happened uh, on that day. We'll be back with uh, Hugh Turley on The Beloved Community. My guest is Hugh Turley. His book is called uh, The Martyrdom of Thomas Merton, an Investigation. Uh, welcome back. Let's talk about uh, what, what do you think really happened? Well, what really happened is I think the CIA killed Thomas Merton. That's what I think really happened. And, and uh, I tell you, I'll tell you how you can tell that that's what really happened. And it's 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 sort of just if you kind of just look at how things are reported, and how the press treated the death of Thomas Merton, and how they've treated uh, the, the story and, and and him just as a person overall. I mean, they reported from the very beginning that this was an accidental electrocution. And it was based on anonymous Catholic sources. That's what they said. An anonymous Catholic source told the press that Merton died of accidental electrocution. And that's, the be that's how the story began. Now, if, if an average person kills somebody, the press doesn't cover it up for you or me or anybody else. I mean, they ask tougher questions. But in the case of Thomas Merton, you see how the press behaves, and that's a big tell. And I told you in the beginning, I, when you asked me how I got interested in this, the death of Vincent Foster, the deputy White House counsel, how I got interested in that was the day 
after he died, the newspaper reported that the body was found by an anonymous passerby. And I remember I read that in the paper, and I said to myself, wait a minute. How could it be found by an anonymous passerby? That person's a witness. They could have seen, well, they did see the scene, and they could have seen the murderer. They could be the murderer. And whatever they saw, it's very important. I thought, you've got to know who found the body. How could you not know who found the body? And you ask the average American who found Vincent Foster's body, nobody knows the answer to that question. I happen to know, but most people don't know. But it's never been reported who found the body of Tom, of, of, uh, of Vincent Foster. So you see how the press behaved in that case because it's a government cover-up. And when you have a government cover-up, and same with the Kennedy assassination and King assassination and others, the press plays a pivotal role in the cover-up. And the CIA had a manual on assassinations and how they do... They, the Mertens is what the CIA classes of FISA is a secret assassination. That's an assassination that's supposed to look like an accident or natural causes. It's right out of their manual, and the press reported it as an accident, and the press is infiltrated with the CIA. The CIA is heavily into the into the American press. A lot of people, I mean, you can just Google that, and you'll find there's plenty of evidence that the CIA is involved with the American press and the information that we get. But that's the, the real tell is how the press reported it that the CIA is involved in it. We don't know exactly the name of the person who killed Thomas Merton or who actually killed Vincent Foster, but we sure know who covered it up. It's the American press. And uh, in cooperation with the, with, with the Thai police and press. Oh, of course. But the Thai police and the, and the American uh, government were, were, I mean, we were giving them millions, like hundreds of millions of dollars a year. They were the, they received more money than any other country in Southeast Asia except for Vietnam at the time. And their soldiers were fighting with our soldiers in Vietnam. We had air bases flying 1,500 missions a day out of Thailand. And we were also smuggling drugs with the Thais. I mean, the Thai police were just an extension of the CIA. I mean, that they, they, were, they were working for us. And they get their own money and their guns and everything from us. I mean, we were just we're together. Well, one of, the, uh, you know, one of the obvious things that you point out, I mean, there are just a number of things. There was no autopsy. Um, the guy uh, who was the last seen uh, talking with uh, Thomas Merton was this uh, religious leader, DeGroon, uh, who not only last seen, but he was the one who found, supposedly, um, mm -hmm. Merton. And so he would be like suspect number one. I mean, uh, what do you, and, then, and then he disappears. He's like, he's like a ghost. Yeah, he's a very strange man. He, he he had several different versions of his story, of this uh, shout and noise that he heard and when he heard it. He changed his story all the time. When he was uh, being interviewed by the police, Father Say was there, and he said he was twitching and nervous. And I, I remember I read a letter from Father Say that said that he said, Father Francois de Grun gives me the creeps. Hmm. He described him. He was a very strange person. I, some people have asked me if he was the killer. Yeah. I don't think so. I don't think he's capable because he's just too. He, but he, he might have been a patsy if necessary. He had a role, right? He had to somehow establish this time of, of for, for whatever yeah. three o'clock or, or something like that. He, right. had, he had some kind of, and he had some kind of. It seems to be that uh, you, you mentioned in the book that he had some kind of advanced knowledge because he was nervous uh, e even the before. Day before. Yeah. Yeah, the day before he was nervous and he was pacing. And his story changes all the time. He contradicts himself uh, sometimes three times. He's, he's, uh, he's always changing the story. And he's, yeah, he, he was the last person to see Merton alive. We don't even know what they talked about on the way to the cottage. I mean, it's never, he, he's, he, you know, you try to find the guy, he's just disappeared. I, he was at a monastery in Belgium, and I tried to contact them, and they just they won't answer me. They they won't respond. Now, there's another suspicious about. guy I want to talk to you about. Uh, this this uh, Moffat, right? He was uh, of the press at the conference to report on the conference, and right. but but he wasn't there the very afternoon that uh, Merton was supposed to give his big speech. So he's like absent. What, what, what well, do you make of his role? Speech. Well, he was there for the speech, but then he. He left uh, to go sightseeing when Merton was killed and came back later in the afternoon. Now, Moffat, his role, I'd say, is uh, he, he, was, he, was a, a, he was a journalist. He was there to cover the conference, but you think he would have covered the main thing that happened at the conference. Everybody that went to the conference, this was the big thing that happened was that Thomas Merton died. 
and he didn't really write about that till later. But Moffat was very careful in his writing. He he was very crafty because he didn't want to say something that wasn't true. But at the same time, he knew a lot more than he told. He never wrote about the photograph. He had a copy of the photograph, too. The Filipino sent, Father Say sent Moffat a copy of the photograph, and he kept it quiet, just like the Abbey. He, in fact, he wrote to John Howard Griffin once, said, and I wrote him a letter, and he said, I have a copy of the not-to-be-shown photograph. Not to be shown. Said, not to be shown. And who, who told me, him it was you know, not to be shown? Right? Yeah, I got a copy of it, but don't worry, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm with you, I'm not going to show it. I mean, I, nobody's going to see it. So Moffat, he, he knew far more than he told. Uh, and he knew he knew that the police report was contradicted by Father Say. He had letters from Father Say that contradicted the police report. And I mean, this is the witness that's actually in the cottage at the time Merton died. I mean, he's he's right there, and his statements contradict the police statements. The police report, by the way, is very interesting because it misspells the name of every single witness. Yeah, and and it does, and it isn't even signed, right? It's not. So there's no name on it. There's no date on it. It has, yeah, it's no title on it. It's no, most of the documents, like the death certificate and doctor's certificate, these things have an embassy report. They have a stamp on it. It's official. It should have a heading on this report that says Royal Thai Police Report on, you know, the death. But there's no heading on it. There's nothing to make it. And there's no stamp on it. There's no signature. It's just, it just arrives, you know, this is the police report. This, you know, it's typer. You don't even know who wrote it. Now, when we well, come to these right. kinds of things, people will 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 uh, will push back and say, "Well, you know, if this really happened, somebody would have talked, somebody would have said something, the Abbey would have done something." But but the Abbey itself uh, seems to be somewhat complicit. Yeah, yeah, they are. They now, well, like, I got to be careful here. We see the Abbey is a lot of there's a lot of monks down there, and they didn't participate in this. So in our book, we were careful to say the Abbey leadership. Uh-huh. And specifically, we're talking about Abbot Flavian Burns and Brother Patrick Hart. Those two were actively putting out false information. And uh, Matthew Fox, who we, we mentioned earlier, I mean, he, he's sort of sympathetic. I mean, he was a Dominican friar, so he's done. Okay, I'm, I'm, uh, I, but I'm not hearing, I'm not hearing uh, my guest here. Are we on? Okay, let's get David on. David, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. This is David Martin, uh, the co-author. We got, we got a, uh, yeah, he, he also the co-author with Hugh Turley uh, of the the martyrdom of Thomas Merton. Welcome. Oh yeah, I'm glad to be on. I'm just, uh, I'm listening to it, and I wanted to make sure a couple of things need to be said that you haven't said yet. All right, please go ahead. Okay, okay. you ask, you know, how 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 was it done? Um, and uh, the bleeding head wound is really the key to, I, I believe. Well, we didn't we, we talk about, about the bleeding that. head wound. How did how did that first come into the picture? Yeah, well, nobody. It's not mentioned in the Thai police report, but it is mentioned by the witnesses. You know, and it was still bleeding. You know, it, it was probably a pretty severe wound. And the the biographer, you haven't talked about Michael Mott either, the biographer, and uh, he sort of. He's the first one that even mentions it in public in the 1984 biography. And he kind of dismisses it, well, it happened when he fell on the floor. Well, it's a level floor, you know. But uh, I think that's the key to the death. You know, it's either, uh, as we say in the book, either a shot with a small caliber weapon that wouldn't produce an exit one, uh, and using a silencer. That, that would, that's the most likely explanation of death, I think. Or, uh, you know, Trotsky was killed by an ice axe, you know, that, that, that mountain climbers used. Uh, you know, and that would produce a similar wound, you know, if you hit, hit them in the back of the head. And, and the CIA assassinations manual, as we talk about in the book, uh, describes killing a person in that way, uh, with a, even with, with a screwdriver. You know, somebody who's a very skilled assassin could, could have done it. But I, I think, but anyway, the bleeding head one is, is key. Uh, that's more than likely the cause of death, and this is, of course, why you wouldn't want to have an autopsy. <laughs> yeah. a, yeah, the and bleeding head wound, I guess, death. is the smoking gun, too. Uh, it seems to be there are a, a number of them, and that would be a big one, wouldn't it? Yeah, and the other thing I want to make sure you mention is, is uh, the, the, remember, you know, the, the martyrdom of Thomas Martin.com. Martyrdom of Thomas Martin.com. Yeah, and we have... Uh, 
we have an account of uh, an abortive uh, interview that was Terry might want to talk about. That he he was supposed to be interviewed by a New England uh, public radio station, and it, it lasted about five minutes. And we talked about that, <laughs> and it well, never, but... never never aired. And in fact, the general reception that we have had by the so-called Merton community. I did get to go speak in Rome to to a group, but uh, in the U.S. we've been turned down right and left. <laughs> really? They don't, they don't want to hear us. They don't want to hear you. Well, I want to hear you. Uh, Kabu wants That's to hear right. you. I'm glad you're on the air. In fact, I've only got about two minutes left, but I want to talk about that now with this photo out, with your book, you've got new new information, really new evidence. Uh, is there a possibility of, of a new investigation? I was listening on Democracy Now! just yesterday of a new investigation opening up with the murder of Emmett Till uh, back in the 1950s. And so, um, I mean, a, a homicide is still a homicide, even if it's 50 years later. Yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> are they going to reinvestigate the Martin Luther King and the Bobby Kennedy assassinations? Yeah. And this one, this one's too big, I think. Uh, and that's that's the problem. It's, it's it's too important. It's not that it's unimportant; it's too important. Right. Right. <laughs> Uh, Hugh, are you still there? Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's something. I, 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 they could exhume the body. You know, he wasn't cremated. They, they could still exhume the body and determine. One of the excuses they, is given by the Abbey is that it's going to hurt sensibilities. What do you think of that? <laughs> well, that's, it was, it was, they gave that excuse even not to publish the our very tasteful drawings and hurt yeah. sensibilities. <laughs> I mean, uh, clearly that's uh, that's a rationalization. It's not a reason. Um, they, they've been covering it up from the beginning. Now, I, I wouldn't. The, the current people I mean, were not part of the cover up, but uh, for some reason, maybe they will come around. The current people, we we still have hopes for that. Well, your book might open it all up. Uh, the Martyrdom of Thomas Merton, an investigation. The authors, both with me, uh, Hugh Turley and David Martin. I've just got about 30 seconds left. Uh, gentlemen, uh, a last word uh, about your book? I'll let you go. You do it. Hugh, are you with me? I don't think he's there. So, David, oh, you give the last there. word. No, I think he well, the last word... Uh... Again, go to our website, thomasmerton.com. Uh, you, your interview will be up there as soon as you've, you've got it on your website. We have the interviews, and uh, we have the paper I submitted in Rome to the monastic conference there. Uh, we, you know, we've been rejected for the next the International Thomas Merton Society meeting in Santa Clara, California, next year. But uh, the guy that rejected this has, has written in his book uh, that he died from coming out of a shower. So I guess he didn't want to be exposed. Uh, uh, it's Michael Higgins, by the way, is his name. <laughs> I, I, I'm out of time. Uh, uh, David Martin, thank you. And